So again, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're excited to see everyone here. And just a reminder that um, as participants in the webinar, you all should be muted as well as your cameras are turned off. I would encourage you to use the chat. Um, if you have a question or a comment, um, there will be a couple opportunities for some um, comments throughout this presentation and or you can use the Q&A and um, myself and Ashley Walker, also with Department of Health Services, will be monitoring that throughout and trying to address questions or comments as they come up. This webinar does have closed captioning provided and we also have sign language interpreters that are available for accessibility. We will be offering continuing education units and CRC credits. CRC refers to the Certified Rehabilitation Counselor Training. And those will, the information on those will be included in a post-training survey. And we are asking everyone to complete the survey that will be emailed out, whether or not you're gonna need CEUs or CRCs. Because um, we do use that information to learn about other topics and to get feedback um, on our trainings. And um, so again, so I can that, just use that chat for any questions. But what I'd like to do now is introduce our two speakers today. Um, very excited to be able to share information about the I Can Connect program. Um, a very, very useful program for our consumers in the state and one that I think folks are really going to be excited to learn more about. Um, so with that, I'm excited to introduce um, Danny Caslow. So Danny is a specialist in deaf blindness at the Center for Deaf Blind Persons, and she's worked there for 13 years. Since the program started, Danny has been the primary assessor and trainer of adults in Wisconsin for the National Deaf Blind Equipment Distribution Program, more commonly known as I Can Connect. Danny holds a certificate of graduate study in deaf blind rehabilitation services from Northern Illinois University and an assistive technology professional certification from RESNA, the Rehab Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America. Prior to working at the Center for Deaf Blind Persons, Danny was a special education teacher in Milwaukee and Racine. Along with Danny today, we have Deanne Lauterbach, Lautenbach. Um, Deanne has been a specialist in deaf blindness, a teacher and support service provider, SSP, at the Center for Deaf Blind Persons for 13 years. Deanne has a Bachelor of Science from UW-Milwaukee in interpreting. She also holds a post-baccalaureate certificate from Cardinal Stritch University in teaching. Deanne worked as an interpreter in the public schools as well as a freelance interpreter and taught in West Allis and New Berlin school districts. Deanne has been working with the I Can Connect program since the first year it was established in Wisconsin as an ICC assessor and trainer. Deanne works primarily in the Metro Milwaukee area with adults and throughout the state with children. So I think we are in line for some good information today and I'm gonna turn it over to Danny and Deanne. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, we appreciate it very much. We're very excited to share some information with you about the I Can Connect program and a little bit about the Center for Deaf Blind Persons where we both work as well. Um, the uh, focus of today's um, topic is uh, figuring out which of your consumers might be able to benefit from the I Can Connect program. And the introductions, I think that uh, Laura covered them pretty well, but I'll pass it over to my co-host today, Deanne. All right, uh, yes, thanks, Laura, for the introductions. Um, we're gonna keep moving forward here. Um, first and foremost, uh, I, Danny and I both work at the Center for Deaf Blind Persons, um, CDBP for short. Um, the center 
was founded in 1985, about a year after um, the founder, Ruth Silver, had started the social group WISH with impaired sight and hearing. And uh, since that time, the agency has been the only agency in the state of Wisconsin to provide services specifically for and exclusively for deafblind individuals. Um, and we are one of only a few agencies in the Midwest that also um, that do um, provide uh, services for deafblind individuals. Um, and I think one thing that really quick while we're talking about deafblindness is that when we speak of deafblindness today throughout the presentation, we're not just talking about the Helen Kellers that we all seem to know and understand for deafblindness, but that deafblindness has a varying degree of um, differences. There are those who were possibly born deaf and are um, latent blind or vice versa. So we'll get more into depth on uh, deafblindness and the definition but just wanted to give you a little bit of background on that. All right, continuing with um, the Center for Deafblind Persons, we um, at the center offer a variety of services to the deafblind community. Most specific are um, independent living skills, um, skills of daily living, such as budgeting or um, housekeeping or learning how to do laundry. We have communication. Um, alternative communications are important for deafblind individuals. Uh, different technologies, adaptive technology, that's become a big thing recently in the last 10 years. I've seen such a change in growth and technology over the past decade that it's very important and our consumers need to keep up with that as well. And finally, orientation and mobility training. Um, that's an important feature as well. And, um, you know, we think that deafblind are isolated and all of these tools allow them to get out and to be, you know, very capable, independent individuals in the community. Other services that we provide are support group. Uh, clearly, that's an important element. Um, it's a great group of, that allows individuals who have similar issues to get together, problem solve, and to just share their concerns. Uh, we have a wonderful support service providers um, program through our agency. And for those of you who don't know what an SSP is, uh, we do offer training in that. But it's um, for deafblind individuals to be able to get out into the community and to do independent activities, but with support. Um, there is an individual who's with them, whether to communicate for or to just assist that individual in the community. Support service provider allows that individual to guide, to lead the um, activity, but to be able to be as independent as other individuals. And finally, outreach or professional development. Today is a great example of our professional development. We also offer outreach into the community um, in schools and um, to senior um, agencies. Right now, obviously, it's more remote, but we do provide a lot of education to individuals and to community groups to understand and to get better knowledge of the deafblind community. So we hope you've all heard of I Can Connect or ICC, but um, I'm sure what you know varies. And here's just sort of the quick uh, summary about it. It is a federal program that's overseen by the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, uh, but it's run locally by each state or territory, and it's in all 50 states and the territories as well. The Center for Deaf Blind Persons and how we got involved, we are the agency that's contracted to manage I Can Connect here in Wisconsin. The program provides equipment and training for two-way long distance communication, which um, we'll define later. Um, and it is exclusively for people who are deaf blind. Yeah. Sorry, I had a little unmuting problem there. <laughs> Today, <laughs> it's 
sorry, this technology is a little uh, fresh for me, new for me. All right, today's objectives. What we are hoping that when you're done with um, this training today, these are some of the things we're hoping that you're gonna walk away with. Um, we want you to obviously learn first and foremost about the I Can Connect program. Um, and hopefully, the, if you already know a little bit about I Can Connect, this will answer some of those questions. We also want you to know the eligibility requirements. Uh, you can't just be um, accepted into the I Can Connect program. There are requirements to be accepted. Uh, it's important to know the major differences between the I Can Connect program and other technology distribution programs. There are others out here, not just in the state, but uh, nationally. And to understand how ours is different and why it's specific for deaf blind individuals. Um, again, we, what's important for you to know is um, how the deaf blindness, the hearing and the vision loss combination has such a functional impact on um, distance communication or even just on daily living. But in this instance, we're talking about the functional impact on distance communication. So we're gonna go into that a little bit with all of you. And finally, we want you to become comfortable with determining if your consumers are likely to qualify for ICC. I know that there are some of you out there that will be considered a testers. And we want you to know and to be confident in that, making that decision. All right, moving on. Um, the purpose today, or the purpose of the ICC, excuse me, is that we, um, we are looking to provide equipment to deafblind individuals. Um, and when they obtain this equipment, we're also looking at um, training and this equipment must relate to two-way long distance communication. And the important part of that is that this is at no cost to the deafblind individual. And what do we mean by two-way long-distance communication? That's important, especially with the I Can Connect program. Two-way long-distance communication, these are examples of, this is um, of some two-way communication, such as telephone calls, um, whether it's cellular or landline, um, an individual, a deafblind individual being able to make video calls or um, to join in a chat, to send emails or receive, texting, Zoom cloud meetings, relay services, instant messaging, and internet. So this, these are examples of types of long distance communication, two-way long distance communication. Right. And this is the important part, or all of it's important, but this is very important. The eligibility of the ICC, uh, there are Three parts, three requirements. Uh, Deafblind consumers must meet all three requirements. First, they must have a hearing loss. Secondly, they must have a vision loss. And third, they must meet the income criteria. And in this case, they have to be below 400% over poverty level. Um, and an example of that would be a household of one at $51,040 for annual income, or a household of two would be $68,960 in an annual income. So those three requirements, again, are the hearing loss, the vision loss, and meeting the income criteria. Those requirements must be met for an individual to qualify for I can Care. Okay, people always want to know what do the consumers receive, which is definitely a fair question. First, they will receive equipment, and that equipment meets the consumer's needs for distance communication. That might be different, that will be different for each person. There is no arbitrary dollar limit on the equipment. So in other words, um, it's not $2,000 worth of equipment for communication, but it is what it's determined the person needs for that communication. There's no specific equipment list. Instead, what the consumer gets is determined by, first and foremost, what does the consumer want to do with the equipment? 
all of those ways of two-way distance communication that Deanne mentioned earlier, they're not gonna wanna probably do all of those things, but which ones do they wanna do? And uh, also, where do they wanna use the equipment? Will they be using it in their home all of the time? Or will they be in the community or other places from time to time using the equipment? And then from those things, a custom solution is built for each consumer. The other major thing that they get besides the equipment is the training. They're not just given or sent a box of equipment and, and said, well, good luck putting that together. Um, they're given help setting up and they're given training um, as needed to achieve their goals for communication. So more specifically, um, people always want to know, well, give us examples of equipment, but it varies so much from person to person. I will tell you that everybody receives one or more of the following general types of equipment. They will receive a main device, and that could be a computer, that could be um, an iPad, that could be a Braille note taker. Um, it could be a cell phone, it could be a landline phone, um, and it may be more than one of those depending on what the needs are. It could be accessibility software if they're getting some type of a computer. Um, accessories, we're big on making sure that people have cases and things like that to protect their equipment. And then um, other items that consumers sometimes need in order to use their main equipment might include things like headphones or some other type of listening um, enhancement, a switch to operate the, the um, equipment if they have other disabilities, a braille display, for example. And in bold, because we can't say it enough, all of the equipment is custom selected for the individual consumer. All right, so this would be our first spot where we'd like to ask if you have any questions of us. Danny, this is Laura. We did receive one question. Oh, great. Um, and it's, I think it's more related to the services overall for Center okay. for the Blind. But is there transportation available for the deaf blind individual to obtain mobility training at the Center for Deaf Blind? The student lives in Kenosha. Mm. And if it's a complicated one, I can connect this person with you post training that, you know, maybe you can reach out um, as well. That, that would be a good idea. Um, Joan Schneider is our executive director and she is on this call now. And she would be the best person to talk to about that because we don't provide the transportation directly, um, but she is finding sources that may be able to um, assist with that. Although <laughs> you may be the funding source that, that, that she would refer to. I don't know. All right, I'll make that connection after. And then we have another we have two more. Um, oh, great. Is the equipment funded directly through the ICC funds? Um, or do ICC staff help obtain funding through insurance, long-term care, et cetera? No, there's, it's directly through the I Can Connect program. And we will later on in the presentation talk about in great detail, maybe more than you want, the, the um, process for the client getting the equipment. But there's no third party involved in the funding. Okay, great. And then the third question is, is there a vision and hearing loss criteria that needs to be met? Yes, and Deanne will cover that uh, later on. Perfect, that's it for questions that I see now. Okay, all right. And now Deanne has a question for you all. Oh. Thank you. All right, um, you've heard a little bit of information. How many of you can think of consumers that you right now would consider deafblind? And if there are any of you out in the participants out there that want to maybe give us an idea or describe your consumer to us, um, just to give others an idea of what you would consider someone who would be deafblind. 
And you may use the chat to share that answer if you'd like. And then we had one more question that came in over chat as well. Um, okay. This is from someone who I believe works directly with students. So up to age 21. Okay. Does ICANN Connect cover assistive communication apps such as ProLoquo to go, um, a go talk, et cetera, to help with communication? Yes, but I'll let Deanne cover that since she works with the kids. <laughs> Uh, yes, but they really do have to relate again to distance communication. Um, it has to um, it has to be um, used for the distance communication um, itself. Um, in past examples, we have actually used communication boards, um, so or apps that used um, communication boards for communication because a child was unable to speak or to use sign language. And the communication board uh, itself had, um, was the, uh, the form of communication. So that app was used to um, assist the individual with the communication. Um, and later on, we're gonna go over some examples of you know, how deaf blindness and functional um, impact and those all kind of tied together. So I hope that answered that question. We had one more question um, and I actually just answered it, um, but it's someone was asking whether if someone was enrolled in a long-term care program, would that impact their ability to apply? Um, I saw that your answer was no, it would not, and you're absolutely right, but I'm really glad that you re read that question out loud because um, that's one that we didn't include in our presentation, and now we will from now on. The uh, long-term care um, is a problem for some other programs, but not for I Can Connect. Great, and we've got a couple examples that have been shared that I can read out loud. Oh, great. So um, someone indicates, I have several clients who have cerebral palsy that have severe to profound hearing loss and cortical vision loss. Would they qualify? That was one, I was asked that was more of a question. They may qualify. The, um, it's going to depend on how the combination of vision and hearing loss affects their functional ability to use the equipment. And I think You'll get a taste for that later in the presentation. If not, please contact me after the presentation at any time. We'll have our email address available to you and, and phone numbers and so forth. Um, but uh, probably. Okay. And then we've got a couple other comments. One is um, in answer to Deanne's question was yes. One consumer meets the qualification, wears hearing aids in both ears, blind. Um, did use a service dog um, until the dog died, um, lives independently now in her own home. So there's an example of a consumer that has, would apply. Um, and then um, I work with elderly individuals with both hearing and vision impairment. Some are veterans. Would these individuals benefit from the program? Um, I have two consumers that I can think of. I work with uh, um, elderly and physical disabilities. Um, for my elderly folks, it is usually macular degeneration that has progressed along with hearing loss related to aging. So we do have some folks out in our audience that um, are identifying some consumers as you guys are presenting. So that's great. That yeah. is. Oh, go ahead, Tan. <laughs> um, I was going to say that's what we were looking for is for you, the participants, to um, get some thoughts and in, in, um, look at and identify some of the individuals that you are currently working with and hopefully you'll get more from that. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Definitely. All right. From now, hold on to those thoughts. We might give you an opportunity later to give us some more ideas, but we want to keep going so we don't run out of time here. All right, so I've been asked before, why is there a program specifically for deaf blind people? Can't they just go to a program for the deaf or a program for the blind? And really it's because of that functional impact of the disabilities combined that I was referring to with the question regarding the consumer with cerebral palsy. 
what the functional impact means in this case is that it's very difficult for someone with both hearing and vision loss to compensate for one of those losses with the other. And uh, we thought the best way to illustrate that would be with some real life examples. So here are some real life examples. All right, um, our first consumer um, is Steve. He is a deaf individual um, and he wants to use a phone. The obvious solution for uh, any deaf individual, for most deaf individuals, is to use a video phone. You can get on the video phone, chat away. The problem that we have is that Steve has no usable vision, so a video phone is not a viable situ possible solution for him at this point in time. All right, just keep that thought in your head. Mm -hmm. Yep, our second consumer we'll call Shirley. She is hard of hearing. She wants to use a phone, and actually we tried an amplified phone with her and it worked quite well, but she couldn't hear it ring without her hearing aids. The obvious solution is um, a flashing ringer. That's a very common solution used by deaf or hard of hearing individuals. But for Shirley, she also has a visual field loss, which means that she's got essentially blind spots and so she is not consistently able to use a flashing ringer. So that was a problem. And the third consumer? The third consumer is Andrea. Uh, she's blind. She wants an iPhone like many of um, the next generation do. Um, and for this, an obvious solution for a blind individual is to modify by adding speech. However, our consumer is also severely hard of hearing. And hearing, um, hearing as well as her own speech on the phone is often misunderstood. So that, um, the, we need to look at something different maybe for this consumer as to adapting to her hard of hearing, or her hearing loss, excuse me. So I'm sure you're wondering, or I hope you're wondering, what we did for these consumers. And we will get back to them, um, but I wanted to focus on the point right now. And that is that deaf blind is not the same as just deaf plus blind. It's almost more like deaf multiplied by blind um, because of the additional problems that combination creates. You cannot um, make up for the hearing loss with vision and vice versa. It, it gets sticky and it's a unique disability and each person that we see presents with sort of a unique combination of vision and hearing loss. All right, with what we've told you, we're going on now to talk a little bit about definition of deaf blindness. Um, and this is for the ICC um, purposes just so you're aware, the information that handouts that are provided with this um, presentation, the, um, that there's a handout that the application, excuse me for I can't connect, does give the HKNC or Helen Keller National Center's um, definition of deaf blindness in its entirety on, um, in the application. But for our um, use today, we made it a little bit easier for you as well as myself to understand. Um, there are three parts um, for to define a deafblind um, individual. First, the consumer must be deafblind. Uh, the vision would be a 2200 or less in the best eye with correction, or they would have a 20 degree um, visual field loss, or they would not yet be legally blind, but have a diagnosis such as um, macular degeneration or retinitis pigmentosa, as I'm sure some of you have talked already about consumers who have macular degeneration. Secondly, they must also have a hearing loss, and it has to be severe enough that that individual cannot understand most speech, even with hearing aids. Or 
um, and most hearing losses are progressive, um, the hearing loss will progress so that it becomes a severe loss for the deafblind individual. And thirdly, uh, the combination of the vision and hearing loss, it needs to have a functional impact on the individual's daily life. And that would include the ability to use distance communication. Um, I'm gonna just jump back to one of the other examples we talked about before with the blind individual who wanted to use the iPhone. Well, we did make modifications, but there's still a severe enough hearing loss that that made a functional impact um, on that individual's um, use of equipment. So those are the three um, definitions or the three parts of the definition of deaf blindness. Now, we're gonna to touch on this also. If you have a consumer who has a hearing and or vision loss that can't accurately be measured, such as the cognitive or behavioral issues, such as CBI, um, those still can be, those individuals still can be um, considered for the program. We just need to do a functional or performance assessment on them. And um, it's a little bit different, but we're able to um, still reach out to those individuals that the vision hearing loss are differently related. All right. All right, I'm bringing back that question again. Now, we've gone through the definition of deaf blindness, and um, I just want you to think again if you can think of other consumers now that we have giving you this definition um, who possibly would qualify for I Can Connect. Let me give you a minute. If anybody can think of other people or want to ask a question about it at this time, you can go ahead and do that. All right. Um, I'm not seeing anything. No. Oh. Neither am I, so I think we're good. I'll, if someone does chime in, I'll pop in and let you know. All right, okay. sounds good. Okay, so uh, this is the process. How does your consumer get equipment? The first step is the referral. Uh, sometimes it's a self-referral. Sometimes it is from people like all of you from an outside agency, and we sure appreciate those. And um, I think those people who have referred um, individuals to our program will tell you it makes some of what they do easier as well. Um, healthcare professionals, family members, sometimes other I Can Connect participants will have friends who also would qualify. So we may not see that referral step, but um, that is the first actual step. And then the consumer needs to complete the application. If they need assistance completing that application, we are available to do that if they're not able to do it themselves or they don't have ready access to somebody that can help them. The third step is the approval. Um, Sometimes we may need to ask for additional information on either the financial part of it or on the aspect of their vision or hearing. And oftentimes it's that functional piece that's missing. What, how is the impact of both the vision and the hearing loss affecting them? So sometimes we need to ask for additional information. Due to the fact that most people that wouldn't qualify self-select out, there are only a small number of applicants that do not qualify and are denied, but that does happen. The next step is the assessment, and that takes about two hours. We like to do it in the individual's home wherever possible. It gives us some information about where the technology might be used. It makes the consumer usually a little bit more at ease uh, we see any problems with um, internet or connection, that sort of thing, and it removes the need for transportation. Since this program is statewide, um, most of them would not be able to get to Milwaukee easily or even at all. 
what we determine in the assessment is what are the consumer's goals for the distance communication? That's always the first question. What do you want to do with the equipment? And we also try to learn about any potential barriers to the consumer achieving those goals, whether that be from their vision or hearing or another disability or anything else going on in their life. What, is, what else might impact their success? And then we can determine what combination of equipment might best meet the consumer's needs. Usually by the end of the assessment, the assessor and the consumer are in agreement about the equipment and what makes the most sense. They may not start that way, but usually by the end, they are in agreement about the equipment. And so then the final steps, and I'm giving you all the little details here because your consumers will ask. Um, the assessor writes the assessment report with the justification for the equipment and then recommends the equipment. The equipment is approved. The equipment arrives at the Center for Deaf Blind Persons. And then we call or contact the consumer in their preferred method and do that initial setup of the equipment and the first training. Sometimes that's a two-day affair. If they're getting a computer, for example, with a lot of peripherals, I might go in the evening or in the afternoon and get everything set up and have them do a trial run and then I stay at a hotel and the next day um, we get back together and they have more questions and we practice and do more training. The total training continues until their basic goals are met. And by basic goals, I mean if they say, I want to be able to send emails when I am not at home. And maybe they have an iPad and are using accessibility features with it. So that training would continue until they can use um, the accessibility features on their iPad to send or receive emails. Sometimes we will mutually modify the goals if they um, turn out to um, be either over or under um, what maybe they should have been to begin with, but most of the time we'll stick with those original goals. Okay, and consumer follow-up. When does their case close? This is something that we don't list as being a difference, but this is different about our program too, I think. Consumers can get help using their equipment that they got from I Can Connect for distance communication, either while they're still working with a trainer during that initial goal meeting point, or at any point in the future. They can request a reassessment at any time. Um, the most common reasons are changes in vision, hearing or uh, changes with the equipment, not changes, but changes in their ability to use the equipment itself. Either, um, for example, when an iPhone is retired and is no longer supported, then we'll get them a, a new one. Um, the uh, answer to the when does their case close, we never close cases, although when we've had consumers pass away, then we do mark them inactive. So now we have some real life examples of how people have uh, had changes in their lives and needed to modify their equipment a little bit. Great. Um, Danny, can I back up a little bit? In, yeah. our, in our questions, um, there is a question here that said, would there be additional supports for data renewal, upgrades, updates, et cetera? And this might be a good point to answer that. Yeah, we, um, some of the of accessibility um, equipment like software have the option when you purchase the software to purchase upgrades and we do that automatically like with ZoomText, Fusion and JAWS. Um, some of the um, Braille accessibility software. I mean, uh, some of the uh, vision accessibility software. Um, 
like I said, with the iPhones, we will replace those when they're no longer supported by Apple. Same with iPad. We've been going through a lot of computers. I think our boss, Joan Schneider, has a bunch of computers in her spare room right now because that's where the equipment's being delivered during this uh, time where we're working at home. Um, but we are replacing the Windows 7 machines with Windows 10. Um, we've replaced a lot of them already. Uh, so yes, we do, um, we do uh, make those changes. The consumer, um, some of them are automatic and sometimes the consumer needs to contact us. Great, I'm gonna get us back to where we're heading. Some of our real life examples. All right, yeah, the first one is a book called Ron. He was born deaf also has a progressive vision loss, both due to Usher syndrome. Um, when I first started working with him, we got him an iPad, which he learned visually. But after a couple of years, he started really struggling to see that iPad. And he took braille courses on his own, and then he requested a reassessment. And in the end, uh, he obtained a Braille display from I Can Connect that he uses daily with his iPad, and he's become very adept and much faster than he was uh, with the iPad at the end of the time he was using it visually. All right. Um, moving on to the next individual, this is Peter. He was born hard of hearing and um, low vision, and he has a progressive hearing and vision loss. Um, and when we first started working with him, he was using a computer and a braille display and really struggled with that, um, the using the keyboard for input and, and just struggled with the computer technology itself. It almost seemed to become too much for him. What ended up happening was we were able to obtain um, an iPhone and Braille display for him. And um, currently he uses it on a daily basis. Uh, it's quite amazing how well he is, how he does. I mean, he can email, he can use social media. He is very up on even just following news and um, current events, um, very impressive. And even his skills are almost surpassing our own as far as <laughs> the knowledge of the iPhone and uh, Braille display. The next one is a little bit different. This is Mary. Um, when uh, she has a form of ushers and she was uh, she's born hard of hearing but had a progressive hearing loss and by the time I met her she was deaf um, also had a progressive vision loss and we started her with an iPad which she learned visually um, as her vision began to deteriorate she got cochlear implants because she was worried about being fully deaf blind and she worked really hard with those cochlear implants and did very well. In the meantime, her vision loss continued to progress. At this point, her hearing is now better than her vision. And so we didn't need to change up the type of equipment that she was using, but she did need some uh, training on how to use the equipment with um, with different accessibility features instead of um, using voiceover with the speech, she's using it with gestures. Or she, instead of using uh, Zoom, she's using voiceover with speech. That's what I meant to say. But yeah, same equipment, um, but she, she presents very differently now. Um, all right. All right, now that we've talked about a few of the changes, um, how individuals have progressed through the program with I Can Connect, we're going to talk a little bit about how I Can Connect is different than other um, agencies that provide um, 
equipment for whether it's deaf or blind or deafblind individuals. Uh, specifically, obviously, I Can Connect is only for deafblind individuals. It is a needs-based program. I think that's very important to understand. Quite often, you will get consumers who come in and say, this is what I want, get me this. Please understand it's needs-based. Um, and Danny talked about that a little bit before. We're matching the needs of um, the consumer. And it's something that the consumer and the assessor do agree upon. Um, important also is the fact that we include training. How often in my years of working have I met individuals who are like, hey, I got this great piece of equipment. They use it two or three times and it goes in the closet because they are frustrated and don't understand how to work it at all. With this program, with I Can Connect, we're giving the training, we're making sure that when we leave the consumer, they are able to meet their goals and they are able to complete distance communication um, independently. So another really important part is doubt. There's no dollar limit. Um, that is very important um, for many of you who know anything about um, equipment, technology equipment, specifically for deaf blind or other adaptive equipment. It's expensive, um, and this is a great um, opportunity to get the type and the right fit for individuals. There is no waiting period for future equipment. Um, I do know of other uh, programs that have maybe a three or a five year waiting period. What we do look at is that the individual has had a change in vision and or hearing or a situational change that might require um, or will require uh, a different form of um, equipment. Um, and most, um, uh, finally, not most important, but finally is the copay. Um, a lot of programs do uh, um, expect a copay. And in this situation, there is no copay, no you know, money down to get your equipment or to get your application in. Um, and that's very important. So the deaf blind consumer pays nothing for what they're receiving the equipment, the training, and um, the you know, opportunity for the distance communication. All right, uh, you remember back, it's only a few minutes, uh, with Steve, Shirley, and Andrea, the consumers that we were telling you about with the functional problems between having the dual sensory loss. I'm sure you wanna know, what did we do for them? Let's see. All right, we're gonna go back to Steve. Uh, if you remember, Steve was a deaf consumer, wanted to be able to use a phone. Um, the obvious solution that we said before was a video phone. Um, anyone who works with the deaf community, that, deaf, that video phone is a very important part of their lives. Um, in Steve's case, that was not feasible. Uh, he could not use a video phone because he had no vision. So the solution that we came up with for Steve is that he's a Braille user um, and he was able to use a Braille display um, as a TTY on his computer. And yes, I know TTY is our older technology, but for Steve in this situation, it worked. Um, but I think what's also important to note here is that um, that's where Steve is, but we are working with Steve and with other consumers to keep them moving forward in their knowledge and use of technology so that they don't get left behind or forgotten or that the technology gets past them and then they're stuck with old equipment. So in this case, we're um, still looking at um, other types of equipment to keep Steve moving forward in um, to the 21st century and beyond. <laughs> um, that's a good point, Deanne, because you can't, you can tell a consumer what you think are the best options, but if they have a different choice, sometimes using that different choice is the right choice. And if you have the ones for backup in case that older technology stops working for them, um, then you're set. The second one is Shirley. She was the hard of hearing consumer who wants to hear, use the phone, 
She could hear fine on the amplified phone, but she couldn't hear it ringing without her hearing aids. And she wouldn't be able to see the flashing ringer consistently. What we did, I learned that Shirley only takes off her hearing aids while she sleeps. So a bed shaker that works with her clock vibrates and alerts her when her phone is ringing at night, which was her main concern, that she would miss an emergency call. And that wouldn't work for somebody, I know several consumers who take their hearing aids off as long as they're home alone. So that wouldn't work for them, but it worked for Shirley. All right, and the final consumer we talked about was Andrea. Um, again, she is blind and um, wants to be able to use an iPhone. I think, you know, so many younger um, individuals want those iPhones. We were able to modify the phone so that she was able to hear it using speech. Um, however, she was uh, severely hard of hearing or is still so se severely hard of hearing. So the solution for her was to get um, headphones. And in this case, we use bone conduction headphones um, that headphones allow her to be able to hear and understand um, when using the phone. It also allows her to respond correctly to what she's hearing. And one other thing I wanna point out with the reason we went with a bone conduction headphone as opposed to a, the standard or typical headphone is that this also allowed this consumer to hear ambient noise. Um, it was kind of a, a safety feature, so to speak, um, so that when she is carrying on a conversation, she's also able to hear the noise that's going on around her for her own safety. All right. Your turn. We are going to um, move forward with three other consumers and we'd like a little bit of um, feedback from you to let us know with these consumers what you know what you think. Do you think they would qualify for I can connect? We move to the first one. All right. And in, in addition to whether or not they qualify. If you can let us know why or why not, why you think they do or why you think they don't. The first one is Joe. Joe is 22 years old. He has Usher syndrome and he has been severely hard of hearing since childhood. Joe is now struggling with changing vision. So folks can, this is Laura, you can go ahead and use chat. Otherwise down at the bottom, um, when you click participants, you should see an option to do kind of a yes or no check following your name. And then visually, you'll be able to see that as well. And we've got one chat. Mm -hmm. um, so Molly says, I guess I would ask what the vision diagnosis is and what is he struggling with? Mm, okay, good questions. The vision diagnosis would be uh, retinitis pigmentosa because that's the vision loss that goes with Usher syndrome and I will give you the hint that that is always a progressive loss. Does that help from that same? Uh, oh, then yes. Okay, I saw it. Then yes. And then we did have one other, there's another question that it, um, someone's asking, would someone with an auditory problem, it's not necessary to this or connected to this example, um, mm -hmm. but would an auditory processing disorder qualify a consumer? And I've had that question myself before related to TAP and TAP and other telecommunication funding. And what was the, um, the outcome in those situations? I don't think we've had that come up. And I would have to really reach back on that. I just know it's come up, but I believe <laughs> those few did have alternative funding options. Okay. Um, they were seeking employment, so we were able mm -hmm. to work with the vision of vocational rehabilitation. Um, yeah. I think we would need a good bit of documentation to make it, uh, to make it work, and uh, that functional component, the functional impact would be um, probably the key piece to that. And that is one thing on these examples. Um, there are definitely some gray areas. Uh, so don't be afraid to offer a 
question with a real consumer. Do they qualify? Don't they qualify? And uh, we'll work on it and let you know whether it's worth applying or not. Usually it's worth applying. And a couple of folks have said that he has the hearing loss and the progressive vision loss, but really how is it impacting his communication? So they're, they've clued into, it's not just those diagnoses, it's that functional impact. Yep. That second sentence, Joe is now struggling with changing vision, um, gives a definite clue to that it is causing some kind of a functional impact. And um, it would depend on what the uh, application offers is an attester statement that speaks to that. Um, and uh, Deanne will get into that a little bit later who can, who can attest and who can't. But um, looking at that, how is there that functioning? Um, making a difference is changing vision. The vision loss we said with ushers is progressive. So that means he's going to qualify under that progressive condition likely to lead to legal blindness and the severely hard of hearing. We just need that functional statement to tie it all together. But um, almost certainly this consumer will qualify. Great. And then we have one additional con comment from Andrew. Um, yes, it would be good to teach the technology before additional vision loss occurs. That's true. And we do teach, we do assess for where they are now, not where they, we expect that they might be later because they need to use the equipment now too. So yes, I knew that the consumer, um, Ron, who was using the iPad visually would probably need a different method of communication later on down the road and not too far down the road, but he's still got an iPad to use visually because that worked for him while he learned Braille. And then Joy remembered one additional thing that has to be considered is whether he would qualify financially. Yeah, we're sort of assuming the financial for just these examples, but you're absolutely right. And you know, gold star for you for that one, um, because that will, that will show up on the questionnaire for the CEUs or, or um, I forget what the DVR version of CEUs is, but uh, uh, what is it? The All I'm getting is echoes, but that the other thing, the CEUs and the whatever. CR the, yeah, it's CRC. CRCs, yes, sorry. And Joy would get chocolate if we were in person, but. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Exactly. We'd be throwing little uh, snacks at you. <laughs> um, anyone else want to chime in? I'm going to, I think, move on to the next uh, example we have here. I think we're good. All right. Harriet is the next uh, individual we have. Harriet is 90 years old and wears hearing aids. Um, and every time you call Harriet, you realize you have to raise your voice when you're speaking to her on the phone, talking a lot louder each time. Harriet also has stopped going to the eye doctor years ago because her glasses were no longer working for her. Does she qualify and why or why not? And this is Laura. I think you may have stumped them a little bit. I'm not seeing <laughs> any votes, uh, yay or nay, yet. Well, well we got a couple. We got a couple. Of okay. <laughs> so Molly says I would get the info on her diagnosis because she probably has some visual impairments that impact her functioning. And Tracy says her level of vision loss and how it impacts would be, need to be evaluated. And, and then Molly- Oh, good question, Tracy Miller. Can it be corrected? 
And um, the hearing loss, is, is it progressive? Um, does she need to be legally blind? That came from Diane. Um, and the eye exam is needed. That was from Jerry. So people are realizing that they need additional information in order to weigh in on the eligibility. Right, and I think that in this case, we're looking at maybe we, there would be additional information. As participants out there, um, I'm sure you have all um, had experience or hope or assume some of you had experience with some of your older consumers who uh, have got, who have a progressive vision loss that they have gotten to a point where glasses just aren't helping, especially when we're looking at uh, macular degeneration or glaucoma, well, it's easier to throw those glasses to the side and just function with what vision you have. So correct, that's definitely, you know, there would have to be more information, but in this case, the best answer right now is maybe. We still, maybe mm -hmm. at times, I still need, would need more information. Yeah, and we had I, Cole Sanders say that I would say no, um, because the vision, you know, we don't know if it can be corrected with glasses because she simply hasn't been. Correct. Right. We don't know at this point in time. You're right. Um, yeah, like what I'm saying, however, is if you are an individual who knows, let's say you are um, a qualified attester in this situation and you know this consumer and you know that she has macular degeneration, and you know that it's progressed to a point where um, she's not seeing any central vision, no face, all she's really getting is light uh, perception, then in that situation, you can attest that, yes, her vision is not usable at this point in time. Does that help in that understanding of it? We can get more information, but if you as an attester see that she, um, you know she can't function with the vision she has um, and her hearing is, um, has progressed so severely in this situation, then you could attest yes, if that's, if you're familiar with her vision and hearing loss. Danny, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, even, you know, I, I think that everything Deanne said is true, but even if you're not comfortable yet, with attesting to this person's vision loss, this is a person we would want to hear about. This is a person that probably would qualify. We absolutely 100% need more documentation on the, um, the vision loss especially, or how her vision is impacting her hearing. But if this were a real life consumer of yours and you knew her personally, you could probably speak to how her vision and her hearing were fighting each other, how she wasn't able to use her vision to um, help compensate for her hearing loss. So if you think they might qualify, give us a call and we'll ask you some questions and decide if it's worth sending them for documentation to back some of this up. Right. Yeah, I, I second that. I think that many people that you and that's where I think we are trying to make you understand that deaf blindness isn't just the Helen Keller deaf line. We are talking about a variety of different hearing and vision loss um, abilities. So do make the, do make an attempt to say, hey, I think this individual um, would benefit and or could benefit and mm -hmm. can always determine the qualification. Yeah, and especially if you have tried some kind of adaptation that you're aware of for vision loss and it's not working with an individual because of their hearing, that's a red flag that you should be contacting. I can connect about that person or vice versa with the vision and hearing. And Danny, I need to just interrupt briefly. Mm -hmm. um, it apparently that there is a fire alarm going off in the building at One West Wilson, where our interpreters are located. Oh no. So um, I have to apologize. They are required to leave the building. Okay. So um, if anyone is needing access, we still have our closed captioning available. 
and I do apologize um, that they're required to leave the building. Well, thank you for that important thank announcement. You. Right, um, I'm going to move on to the next consumer. Okay, this is the last one, and I think you're all so well educated on this now that you're going to have no problem with this. Rachel. Rachel is deaf and uses sign language as her primary mode of communication. She wears glasses. Comments? <laughs> nah, says mom. Yep, that's. Well, she could. We just don't know. It's not a no. It's not a no. It's a maybe. She might qualify. We don't know why she wears glasses. Lots of legally blind people wear glasses. Our old boss, Paulette, she wore glasses, legally blind. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't know. We don't have enough information here. But she might. I'm just seeing the beginnings of these comments. What what are they saying, Laura? Um, someone uh, someone is saying from Jean um, Riley Smith says so. Correct and vision doesn't qualify as, as well as hearing correction with hearing aids. Um, well, we don't know how well corrected she is. Just because she's wearing glasses doesn't mean it's correcting to better than twenty two hundred. And it may be that the person qualifies with a visual field loss, which means they have um, either tunnel vision or they have a blind spot. Um, but what vision they have is clear, so they wear glasses for that. So glasses don't tell you anything about how well a person actually sees. They just tell you that there is probably some vision there. Maybe they're decorative. They could be decorative. They could also be protective. Um, people with no usable vision will wear glasses, especially tinted or, uh, um, or uh, glare reduction just to protect their eyes um, due to different conditions. Right, good point, that's true. Great examples. Sorry, I was just looking over the comments. So now that you, um, um, so there, yeah, I just saw the first part of that comment. I'm, they're popping up like notifications. I'm on a, I'm on an iPad because the camera was much better than my computer. Um, the, uh, somebody had said, so there are a lot of people that might qualify. And that's exactly right. If you are unsure, if you think they might qualify, please let us know and we'll help you determine whether or not um, you should, you know, let the person know about the program or whether we don't think they qualify or what kinds of um, documentation we might need for them to qualify. But now that you have an idea of who might qualify, whoops, um, I'd like to talk about what you can do to help and what we would love for you to do to help. I saw a great list of people from all over the state. We still have a few places, a few counties. Since 2013, we've been doing this program and there are a few counties that aren't represented at all. And we would love to change that because we know there are deafblind people in every part of the state. And we would love to find them and at least offer them this opportunity for um, long distance communication. So we'd like you to identify people who may qualify to briefly but accurately explain the program to the potential applicant. And then you can provide them with information on how to follow up and that'll all be in your packet that will come with your survey. It does say at the bottom, make no promises, because um, just in case they don't qualify, and even if they do, 
we can't promise what type of equipment we'll be able to get for them until we really sit down and have that assessment. And Danny, we had a comment in chat um, asking, saying, I work with someone who wears thick glasses and is mm -hmm. deaf, mm -hmm. also has very limited English, and I suspect that there may also be learning disabilities but don't have documentation. Is that person worth it to refer? Absolutely. The thick glasses are kind of a kind of a clue. If you work closely with them, um, have you noticed where they're not able to see things that are, for example, if you're pro providing um, print instead of um, speaking to them, have you noticed that um, there are are uh, problems with reading it that may not be due to learning difficulties but maybe due to they just can't identify the letters or you know have you noticed any problems with that combination of disabilities but yeah absolutely and the limited english um, i do speak fluent spanish and um, deanne has found great ways to communicate with um, people from other countries such as russia and so we'll we'll make it work. Definitely. We're creative that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. This is Laura. We have um, someone saying, have you had um, customers in central Wisconsin, Marathon County? Can you summarize places that you've had referrals? <laughs> so it may be easier to say where the areas that maybe you haven't been. Yeah. Where we haven't been. Yeah. I am trying to think I haven't, I used to keep a list and I haven't for a long time. Um, I am almost certain there's nobody from Iron County. Um, we have had quite a few from central Wisconsin, um, from western Wisconsin. We've had at least one from Door County. We've had only one or two from Kenosha County. I'm not even sure. Oh yeah, we've had one or two from Racine County, but not, not the kind of numbers that the population of those areas would suggest so we're, we're missing a lot of places but i don't care where you're from if you're from the most populous you know the place that we've had the most consumers from ever if you know of another one we want to know about them there's no there's no deaf blind census in wisconsin and the only way that we know about consumers is through word of mouth and this is laura it might be interesting as um Folks may not know that the funding for I Can Connect comes through Department of Health Services. And it might be interesting, Danny, as part of um, my audit process, is to generate annually um, a kind of a heat map of where the consumers that you folks are serving are located, um, just county wise. So that, you know, it might show some shift, um, maybe do one retroactively for last year and see if. And that's one way to know whether our, the outreach is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, I have done that before. Okay, we go to the next one. So here's what you don't need to do. And this is really important. When you think you have somebody that, hmm, I wonder if they qualify. You do not need to yourself provide specific information about the consumer's visual acuity, that's that 2200 or something number, or the hearing loss in decibels, or any other information that would really need to come from a healthcare professional. You do not need to get or provide us with medical or financial records and you don't need to know what kind of equipment the consumer might benefit from. Um, we can do all of those things. Now, if in the course of working with the consumer, you have some of those documents and you have a release from the consumer to share them, by all means, that will speed up the process for the consumer and for us um, quite a bit. We'll definitely take that, but we're not asking you to do that. Yeah. Sorry. That's oh, okay. Um, so uh, you may assist the co consumer with the application. Like I said, we can do that. 
if that's not something that you're able to do with them. Um, but we can do that. Uh, you can assist the consumer with obtaining information. You can contact us for guidance anytime. The big question, do you think this consumer is likely to qualify? Um, you can ask us to send an application in large print, in text only, in whatever format the consumer would like. Um, we can speak with your consumer. You may also write and sign the attester statement that's on the application. What that is, is you're attesting to the fact that the individual has a combination of vision and hearing loss that will qualify them for this program. And you also provide a little functional statement of examples of how that combination of vision and hearing loss gets in the way of their communication long distance. Um, you're welcome to write that. That is um, potentially a billable item. And um, we are tinkering with possibly having some training on specifically that subject in the future. Um, but before you would write one for the first time without that training, please contact us for some guidance so that you don't end up having to write it two or three times. But again, that's optional. You may do that, but you do not have to. And Danny, before we go forward, do you want to just go through that list of individuals we would consider of testers? Yes, let's do that. We should have had a slide on this, but it occurred to me at about nine o'clock this morning. So Deanne's just going to read it to you. Yes. All right. Um, an individual who's uh, individuals who would be considered um, a testers would be an audiologist, a community-based service provider, um, an educator, a hearing professional, an HKNC representative, a medical or health professional, a school for the deaf and or school for the blind, a specialist in deaf blindness, speech pathologist, a state equipment, assistive technology program, um, some uh, vision professional and vocational rehabilitation counselor. So that's just a list of the individuals who would um, be eligible to sign as a testers. Again, I'm going to reiterate, reiterate what Danny said that, you know, if this is your first time signing as an attester, please make sure that you contact the center just so that you can get guidance um, on the process and, you know, making sure that everything's going to go smoothly. All right. If you have any questions on it, again, we will have our contact information at the end. Please make sure to feel free to contact either Danny or myself um, for more information. Give me a second. All right. Um, today, we threw um, some very specific information at you. Um, and we're going to do a little recap and um, hint, hint, if you're getting your CEs or CRCs, uh, we're going to just recap some of the objectives that we've talked about before. Um, first and foremost are the three eligibility requirements. These are very important. The individual must have a vision loss. The individual must also have a hearing loss. And they have to have a proof of income to meet our income criteria. Um, we do um, require um, documentation for the income criteria or proof for that. All right, so those are the three eligibility requirements to be part of the ICC uh, program. Moving on is um, the functional impacts of combined vision and hearing loss. I think throughout the presentation, we've given you, um, well, three prior examples, but we've given you ideas. You guys have actually come up with some of your own ideas. Mm -hmm. Here again are a few examples. Um, we're looking at uh, possibly a deaf individual who cannot use a video phone because of a vision loss. Um, another functional impact of the combined vision hearing loss would be an individual who's hard of hearing, but they can't use a phone ring flash because their field of vision has narrowed um, greatly, or they have a visual field um, change or um, defect. And finally, um, an individual who's blind and they have a difficult time understanding speech 
on the phone because of their hearing loss. So again, those are some, not, those are not all. Please remember there's a variety, large spectrum of different vision and hearing losses when we're speaking about deaf blindness um, and the functional impacts that go with the vision and hearing loss. And um, finally, the major differences between this program, the I Can Connect program, and other um, uh, federally funded or other programs that provide technology resources. First and foremost, we are a deafblind only program. We only serve individuals with a vision and hearing loss. Um, again, it's needs based. We match the consumer's needs for the communication that they need. Um, important, very important, we include training. Um, I think that's huge. In, with my experience and Danny's experience, it's very important that not only do we give this equipment to our um, consumers, but we're providing them training so we know they will be successful. Um, the next would be the dollar amount. There is no limit. Um, with other um, programs, there, there are limits. It's, um, I'm sure many of you know of those programs, but with this, we're looking at no limit. And there's no time restriction. We're not looking at three years or five years or however long. If there is a change and there is a need, we are going to get in to do a reassessment and we're going to work with you on providing new and appropriate equipment. And finally, again, no copay. This is all free to the consumer. All right, those are the major differences. And, um, between ICC and other programs. And I hope that all of this recap has helped you um, and um, we can go from there. Right. Questions about any of it? Sorry, Danny, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and would you like to um, either go to the slide with all of your contact information? I think you had that. Yep, I can do that. Go right there so everybody has that contact information. And mine says temporary. That's my uh, work cell phone for right now. Uh, but uh, if down the road you leave a message on that phone number and don't get back, don't hear back from me, try the other one. That's the center's phone number. And this is Lauren. I'm not seeing additional questions at this point. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Danny and Dean. That was a great presentation. Um, lots of good information. And um, just so you're aware, we, we have reached um, staff from independent living centers today. We've got staff um, from Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. Lots of ADRC folks. Um, some from some technical colleges. So we really covered a very broad range, not only in the providers, but of the state. So I wanna thank everyone for attending our first virtual regional, regional virtual training for the WISTEC for this year. Um, there will be additional trainings forthcoming and in the survey will be a link to sign up for the, um, our, we have a GovD email listing that you can sign up for. Um, we, the AT Council also has a Facebook page. So all of these trainings will be published, both of those methods. Um, but in the meantime, um, we look forward to your feedback and there will be some handouts included. And if you have any other questions about ICC, please reach out to Danny and Deanne um, or anything on AT future trainings or ideas, reach out to me. So have a great rest of your day, everybody. Goodbye and thank you very much. Take care. Thanks.